From Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uh, my name is Rafiq Abdul Shakir. It was Jonathan Williams before I converted to Islam. When I converted to Islam, I changed my name. I converted in 1991 here in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Uh, I was in the military at the time. But uh, it all started, I was born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, basically. Uh, to Christian parents. My father's side of the family is Pentecostal, mother's side of the family Baptist. Uh, I quit going to church maybe when I was about five years old. Neither parent very was very religious. Uh, my mother passed away about 2003. Uh, after the military I went back to Mississippi for a few years and ended up moving back to North Carolina. Uh, been practicing Islam now for almost half of my life. Uh, when I quit going to church, I, I didn't really like it. Like I said, I quit going when I was about five years old. I didn't care too much for the way the Southern Baptist preachers preached. They hollered and screamed. It was almost frightening for young children, I guess, so to speak. You know, and I really didn't care for that. So uh, I started rejecting church at a young age, basically. And I uh, wasn't very religious when I grew up. I never really like claimed to grow up Christian or anything like this. You know, I just uh, I believed in God, but I never could grasp the concept of the Trinity, uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. This concept never grabbed me through my years of a uh, young young childhood and then the teenage being a teenager. You know, 1988, after I graduated high school, and. Uh, First couple years while I was in the military, partied real hard, a lot of alcohol and other things. Uh, I started wanting to change my life after being in the military a couple years, so I started trying to return to church and, you know, become Christian, start practicing a Christian religion. But every Sunday or Wednesday, whenever I would go to church, I'd always find myself doing the same thing over and over again hours after being out of church. So, because I never could find belief or faith in the religion due to the doctrine, you know, of the Trinity. Because I never, you know, could picture God walking on earth like we do, having to eat, drink, whatever, sleep. And uh, so, without having any faith based in the religion, I would always go back out, party, and drink, and so on, you know. So, what, what happened, a friend of mine was Muslim. And he asked me to read about Islam. Well, growing up in Mississippi, to us, Islam was uh, not like a God-fearing religion. They always taught us Islam had an idol god called Allah, and he was a statue, an idol, so to speak. And uh, it was a pagan religion is what we were taught growing up in Mississippi. And so, but a friend of mine, anyway, when I, he asked me to read about Islam, study about Islam. I said, no, nah, this is, they don't believe in God, you know. He said, no, no, we believe in God, read a book, you know. And so I started reading books. I read the Quran, and I guess uh, when I was reading the Quran, I was reading about all the prophets that I had read about in Christianity, you know, Adam, Moses, Noah, Abraham, and th just one more prophet was added to the equation. It was Muhammad, and uh, so, I said, this is the religion I believe in. It believes in the oneness of God and his uniqueness, uniqueness that he's one. There's nothing like him. We can't see him. I said, this is my religion. I felt it right in my heart. It started putting my, my heart at rest, you know. So I guess after about a month of reading the Quran, I converted to Islam. I took my Shahada and became Muslim. And that, that was pretty much the climax of it right there, reaching that point of wanting to change and looking for the right religion. In 1991, uh, May of 1991, I took my Shahada, I became Muslim. Uh, at the time I became Muslim, I knew some Sunnis, but most of the Muslims I knew were Shia at the time. I think I was about one month away from turning uh, 21 years old. And uh, I didn't really know a difference between Shia or Sunni. I never heard the words, basically. Uh, so when I, I became Shia, I 
or when I became Muslim, uh, I took my Shahada and a couple, one Muslim come up to me, asked me, he said, are you Sunni or are you Shia? I said, well, I don't know. I've never heard these words before, you know, and uh, I'd only been Muslim maybe a month. So when he left, uh, one brother said, uh, here, read these books, you know, and I started reading the history of Islam after the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, died, what happened and what transpired after his death. And I concluded that I was Shia, alhamdulillah, you know, um, uh, because uh, this was definitely the course that the Prophet wanted us to take, you know, was to follow Imam Ali, alayhi salam, and his descendants. Some of the obstacles I faced when I first become Muslim was being in the military, the, the United States military at this time. Uh, they, they wasn't too friendly toward Islam, so there were a few obstacles there, but uh, overcame them. Uh, changed my name while I was still in the military. A lot of people didn't want to call me my name. They wanted to call me the old name I had before I converted to Islam. But it wasn't nothing that couldn't be overcame with, you know, proper faith in, in the deen, you know. Well, I wasn't associating with many of my old friends at the time because at the time I became Muslim, I was in the military, my friends were back in Mississippi, uh, so I really wasn't associating with a lot of those. And my family, I told them immediately that I converted to Islam. Uh, they didn't have no bad feelings about it. Uh, my father had a little problem with me, my name changed. He wanted me to have my last name, his, his last name. and. Uh, this is the only problem, but I mean, they've accepted me and my religion. They see it's made me a better person than what I was before. And uh, I don't drink and participate in activities that's dangerous to me or anyone else because I am Muslim, and they see that. And, but my family treats me the same, you know. They still call me my name, Jonathan, but uh, they don't... Uh, they don't mistreat me. They always try to go out of their way when I come to their house to make sure that I'm accommodated, you know. One of the books that helped me determine whether I was going to become Shia or not was a book called The Right Path in Arabic. I think it's al Murajiat, uh, and another book called Then I Was Guided. These were good books. And I, I obtained the Quran, uh, Mirak Ahmad Ali translation of Quran. It's a uh, all the commentary is done off tafsir, that all the tafsir is done from the hadith of the Ahlabayt and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, so this, these books helped me determine, you know, that, this, that being Shah was the correct, correct way to go. Allah knows best whether I've helped anyone convert to Islam or not or whether I've led anything. Allah makes Muslims, you know. Uh, sometimes if we give the information and uh, they're receptive to it, this is because Allah has opened their hearts up for Islam. I don't think any one individual converts people to Islam, you know. I've given information to a lot of people, you know, books or to a lot of people. I haven't seen these people, so I don't know whether or not they're... Shia, whether they're Muslim or what have you, you know. Even today, I still talk to people over Facebook, you know, and give them information uh, over Facebook. I've I send books to people over, you know, through to get their address through Facebook, mail them books, or buy books and have them mailed to their address. It's uh, I receive many books from people as gifts, and it's uh, up to me to return those favors to people, you know. The best way I believe to to spread the way of Ahlabayt is through modeling yourself after their character, you know. Being like Ahlabayt is the best of your ability. This is the best way because you will always stand out amongst other Muslims, you know. You'll, you'll outshine the Sunnis, you'll out, outshine everyone if you model your character after the Ahlabayt. Uh, Give as much information to people about Ahlabayt as you can. Uh, spread the word of Ahlabayt. This is the best way to, to make Shias, you know. In American society, I, I, I don't take the stance of approaching people. I always try to mold my character to make people approach me. Because people in America, they, these days especially, they take offense to religion, you know. Um, America... America's religious stance is not what it was 30, 40 years ago. Uh, so I always try to mold my character to stir people's curiosity to ask me questions so I can explain to them. Um, the way I work, I'm gone eight months out of the year. And uh, in a work environment, we don't discuss religion too much unless someone asks us. When I hear the word Ahlabayt, 
uh, perfection comes to mind. Uh, they were infallible human beings. They lived their life upright and perfect. They did the duty that was given to, to them from a law, and they carried it out to the best possible way it could have ever been carried out. Yeah. When I think of Ahl Bayt and uh, the foremost of Ahl Bayt is Imam Ali alayhi salam, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa salam. Uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam is Amir al-Mu'mineen. He's the only one of Ahl Bayt that carries this title. He's the guide for all the other Imams. He, he passed everything to them, you know. And this is Imam Ali alayhi salam is what I think of when I think of Ahl Bayt. Imam Ali, and after him, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Struggle. When I when I when I hear the name Imam Hussein alayhi salam, struggle comes to mind. Uh, he, he carried out the perfect struggle. He sacrificed family, friends, himself for the cause of Islam to save Islam. If it hadn't have been for his sacrifice, wouldn't be no Muslims today. In my in my daily life. Uh, my struggles are nowhere compared to what Imam Hussein alayhi salam had to face, but uh, any time I reach a point in my life where I'm confined or I feel like I have to struggle, I always think of the battle Imam Hussein alayhi salam had to put forth and his sacrifices. On the day of Ashura, the thing that comes to my mind more than anything is sacrifice, personal sacrifice. The story that intrigues me most about Karbala is the, the story of Hur, uh, the, the sacrifice he made uh, because he had everything in his hands financially, ever material wish he had in this world was is, at, at his exposure. I mean, he, he was the leader of an army. He was promised untold riches if he would have slaughtered Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and he gave all that away and joined the army of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Uh, I feel like this is the choices we make every day out here is the choices who are made, you know, of giving up the material things of this world and uh, joining the the movement of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, you know. This is definitely the, my favorite part of Karbala. The story with Hur, one of the reasons it's so beautiful is once he had through much calculation, he had decided he wanted to leave the army of Yazid and come to the army of Imam Hussein alayhi salam was that when he went to Imam Hussein alayhi salam and apologized and asked for forgiveness from Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam's kindness said, please forgive me, whore, because I cannot accommodate you properly, you know. This is, with the, this is how, how much kindness Imam Hussein alayhi salam had in his heart, not only Imam Hussein, the whole Ahl bayt had this forgiveness in their heart. They, the man that had stopped them from having water for so many days, and they still forgave him and asked for, they asked for his forgiveness for not being able to host him properly. You know, this 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 is the most beautiful thing about Ahl bayt There's one particular hadith that always comes to mind. You know, as uh, there was a time when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was sitting down and uh, he was conversating with the angel Jibreel alayhi salam and uh, that as they were conversating the Prophet noticed that there was an, another angel sitting a distance away from him and the angel was perplexed, he was very confused. The whole time the conversation go, is going on, angels are continuously going back and forth from heaven to earth, back and forth. The prophet noticed this angel's confused, and he asked Jibreel, alayhi salam, says, why is this angel here so perplexed? And Jibreel, alayhi salam, tells the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa salam, that this angel knows the number of everything. It knows the number of the, all the grains of sand on the earth, all the leaves of the trees. It knows the number of all the angels, everything. There's only one thing this angel does not know the number of, and that's when people are sending salawats up on you and your family, that he can't count the blessings that Allah bestows upon this group of people. And this is my favorite hadith, Allahumma salli Muhammad wa Muhammad. AHTV should uh, 
try to spread the word of Ahl al-Bayt as much as possible, you know, um, spread the character of the Ahl al-Bayt, spread the history of what happened after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died, you know, they need to spread this history so that people that are ignorant of the history become aware. This is the best way to make Shias, you know, letting people become aware of the history. Shia Islam, I believe, could cure the ills of society. Um, it, the way of the Akhla Bayt itself can make people change their lives, you know, if they study the character of the Akhla Bayt and study their generosity. Some of the most upsetting things after the martyrdom of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the, one of the first things was they took the, the gift of land that the Prophet had given to Fatima alayhi salam, Fadak, and they stole it from her with an excuse saying that the prophets didn't leave behind any wills, which is just proof throughout the Quran that this is falsehood. Um, some more upsetting things was at Ghadir Kum after the last Hajj of the Prophet and the Muslims that went to Hajj with him, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the Muslims to gather at Ghadir and made all Muslims take allegiance to Imam Ali alayhi salam. As soon as he was killed, the Prophet was killed, they all retracted their, their allegiance to Imam Ali alayhi salam. They said that he was too young to be the leader of the Muslims. They gave forth many excuses, but they feel like their opinion was better than the Prophet Muhammad and they went against the Prophet Muhammad in his wishes and Allah's wishes more or less that Allah wanted Imam Ali to be the successor of the Prophet Muhammad. So they forced people to pay allegiance to Abu Bakr. They went and kicked the door of the Prophet's daughter in and killed her infant that was inside of her stomach. They set the house on fire. They slapped her. They drug Imam Ali out of his house by his beard and tried to force him to pay allegiance to Abu Bakr, which he refused. He never gave allegiance to Abu Bakr. They forced Bibi Fatima alayhi salam out of Medina for crying on the grave of her father. She was so upset with him that when she, before she passed away, she put the curse of Allah upon him. Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, she put the curse of Allah upon him. She said, may Allah curse him and she would never forgive him. <clears throat> and being that she said this, they are cursed till the day of judgment because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I am from Fatima and Fatima is from me. Whoever upsets her upsets me and whoever upsets me upsets Allah. These are some of the many incidents that took place this, this, this wrong that a lot of people doesn't know about. They're ignorant. They need to research this history so they can understand why Shias believe the way they do. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, his values, the values are, that he has is the values of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the way they're kept alive is by the media, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. His actions during Muharram, the first 10 days of Muharram, this, this is the way that his values stay alive. His actions are... Uh, an everlasting imprint that's carried on for 1400 years. Uh, they don't, his media doesn't need money to move. It moves itself. 14 million people went to Abiyin this year on the 40th. Uh, they, this is the type of media that moves itself. It don't need financing from outside. This is a movement that moves on its own and it'll always move on, to, on, on its own until Imam Mahdi alayhi salam comes back. If it hadn't have been for Zainab alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam's sister, the history of what happened at Karbala in detail wouldn't have never come to light. She is the one that told the story to everyone. When they drug the remaining family of the Imam Hussein alayhi salam to Damascus, she's the one that presented the story of what happened in Karbala to the public. She carried the oppression, the, the stories of slaughter to the public people. 
the value of this story and the, the value of everything that happened in Karbala can be carried on through the media today through TV. And uh, we should donate as much money as possible to the television that spreads the word of Ahla Bait, their history, their stories, their character. We should contribute to this cause as much as possible because this is the the way people gather information these, these days is from the TV. Uh, internet people doesn't the, doesn't read the way they used to read they get their information whatever they see on TV this is this is what they take into their heart this is what they believe so I think the media of television and spreading the way of Akhla Bait is, is this is the future if I seen the Imam of my time Imam Mahdi salam if I seen him you know and he appeared in front of me, I would ask him, what am I supposed to do to please Allah? You know, give me the guidance I need. Intercession on the Day of Judgment is something that will definitely take place and the Imams will intercede for their Shia on the Day of Judgment. And if you're not a follower of these Imams and you are friends of their enemies, they will not intercede on your behalf for Allah to forgive you of your sins. Everyone especially should support an all-English TV channel that gives us knowledge of the Ahl Bayt. This is something we're very short of in America. Uh, English-speaking scholars should donate their time, if not finances, to this channel uh, to, to educate people like myself, my wife, my children, people of the public. Muslims and non-Muslims alike could be educated by a, a English TV, uh, English speaking TV channel. Uh, so I, I encourage people should always financially support it. And as I said, English speaking scholars should support it with their time to give us knowledge of the Ahla Bayt.